In this video, I'll walk you through the basics of how to use the educational resources and data tools in this module. Okay, so I'm going to navigate to the online module page on the website, and let's open the module in full screen by clicking the rectangular button on the bottom of the page. Now that the module is open, notice the tab structure along the top. By default, it will always open on the Introduction tab. Let's explore the first lesson by clicking on Level 1. Each level has content in the left sidebar and interactive maps, graphs, and multimedia within the larger right window. In Level 1, learners use interactive maps to predict the likely effects of changes in carbon dioxide on ocean pH. By scrolling down, a graph showing long-term trends in both atmospheric and ocean CO2 appear. By hovering over any part of the data, you can see distinct data points. You can also click data layers on and off and zoom in and out to explore some of the seasonal trends more closely. You'll find multiple choice questions throughout the module, a good way for users to check for understanding. I'm going to make my selections for these two questions and then scroll down to check my answers. And great, I can see I answered correctly. As students progress through this level, they can keep track of their findings by completing the worksheet found on the Teacher Resources page of the website. OK, let's take a look at the next lesson by clicking on the Level 2 tab. In this lesson, students use data and models to understand the relationship between ocean carbon dioxide, pH, and ocean acidification. The lesson starts by prompting users to compare their predictions from level one with actual changes in ocean pH at one location off the coast of Hawaii. The goal is for users to use what they've learned by exploring these relationships to develop their own definition for ocean acidification. And they can do this by following the prompts on the worksheet. Finally, what changes in pH are expected over the next century? Students can use this model to find out. The model is based on best estimates of likely CO2 emissions used in a United Nations IPCC assessment. The model will let you explore projected ocean pH all the way through 2100. Let's move on to the next lesson by clicking on the Level 3 tab. The lesson starts with an animation, and you're able to interact with it to learn about nutrient runoff, where it comes from, and how it plays a role in acidification near the shore. Students can then use this map tool to compare ocean pH data in Hawaii and coastal Washington. From season to season, pH variations are much more extreme near the coast here than what is seen out in the open ocean. Why? Well, near the shore, there's more life, more photosynthetic activity, physical processes like upwelling, and human impacts that result in excess nutrient runoff from the shore. Once students understand how CO2 and nutrient runoff affect ocean pH, they're ready to move on to level four. Here, students will explore the effect of acidification on animals like oysters by examining aragonite data. Aragonite is a form of calcium carbonate that's used by oysters for shell building. To help understand how much of this type of calcium carbonate is available for building shells, Scientists measure the aragonite saturation state of seawater. This measurement describes the tendency for calcium carbonate to form or to dissolve. This plot shows month-to-month -month measurements of aragonite saturation state at a location in coastal Washington. Aragonite saturation states along the y-axis. Time is plotted along the x-axis. The box and whiskers above each month show the range of measurements for that month. Bigger boxes and longer whiskers mean greater variability during that month. So you can see that July is the month with the greatest variability, and February is the month with the least variability. This adjustable blue line is meant to provide a tool for assessing thresholds. For example, let's say that we know from studies that oyster larvae may have trouble growing or building their shells at levels below a saturation state of 2. Let me drag this threshold line down to 2. The pie charts will show you how many observations fall below that line for each month. For example, 85% of the observations for January fell below that threshold, meaning that the conditions in January were largely not good for shell building. 
students can use this tool to figure out when, during the year, ocean conditions might negatively affect the growth and survival of oysters. This worksheet can help students keep track of their findings, and we'll walk them through how to develop a written scientific explanation. And then finally, in level five, students can apply what they've learned about ocean acidification to a different ecosystem in the Atlantic, the Gulf of Maine. They can use any of the tools to explore their own questions. If students are stumped or need ideas, there are a few sample questions here that can be explored using the available data tools. Once students have identified a question, they can use the map tool here to gather CO2, pH, and aragonite data at any of these three locations. One last feature that I'd like to show you is the Get Data tab. Here, users can access the data tools without having to navigate through the lessons. This could be useful if you're interested in developing your own lessons. That's it for the tour. If you need more information about the module, there's a step-by-step -step teacher's guide available on the website. Thanks for watching.